Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, Leveling Up Remote Learning with Classcraft. Uh, this is part of our special series for Google Innovators. Uh, I'm Brian Bellardi, Head of Communications at Classcraft. Uh, I hope all is well wherever you are. Uh, and I appreciate you being here on what is a hot uh, summer day here in North Carolina. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be sharing the stories of Google innovators who have used Classcraft, um, but in particular used Classcraft to help facilitate a transition to uh, a remote learning model, uh, something that I'm assuming that um, a good deal of you are familiar with. Let me just say I'm Brian Bellardi, the head of communications at Classcraft. Um, I have spent almost my entire career in education technology, um, and I also have a 14-month-old son, so I can speak a little bit to the impossibility of uh, trying to watch your kid while you work full time. Um, but it's our panel uh, that you're here to see. So, uh, and you know, fortunately they're much more accomplished than I am. Uh, so Ashley, uh, Gianna, Sean, I'm just gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves briefly. Um, Ashley, maybe we could start with you. Um, I'm Ashley Pfeiffer. I teach uh, seventh grade social studies, um, specifically European history. Um, I have been using um, Classcraft during uh, the emergency of virtual teaching this last spring, uh, and I'm uh, excited to see um, how Classcraft engages students through games um, this coming year as well. Excellent. Um, Gianna, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Gianna Villegas from New York City, a Harlem teacher at a public school. Um, what can I say? I, I started using Classcraft, I would say, two years ago, but then I took a break from it and then went back to it um, when we were pushed into remote learning this year. I am I'm a licensed mathematics teacher, 7 through 12, but I've actually been our school's instructional coach for the last four years, and I just took over um, the makerspace and the computer science lab the last two years. And Sean, why don't you bring us home? Sure. Um, I'm Sean Arnold. I am a special educator and STEM coach in New York City's District 75, which is citywide special education for students with moderate to severe disabilities. It means mostly students with autism. I've been doing that for like 15 plus years. Um, I, I've been using Classcraft since like 2015, not long after Google Classroom became a thing. Uh, I was part of the LAX18 Google Innovator crew. Uh, I was using it deeply when it was less easy to use Classcraft and when it didn't nearly have all the stuff that it does and it was just because I nerded out on it. And in the midst of remote learning, it's been a great incentive for students to go ahead and attend and, and engage in classwork. Excellent segue, Sean. Remote learning. Uh, at this point, we all know it. Uh, some of us may even love it. Uh, either way, it's a reality in these times, uh, whether it's in a fully remote model or a blended model. Um, when it comes to learning, motivation and behavior are critical to improving outcomes. Uh, and obviously, this goes double in a remote learning environment. Um, so here's something that, uh, or here's a headline that you might be familiar with. Um, so student motivation has been a focus of Classcraft from day one, um, but now in this kind of post-COVID world, we're seeing motivation turn into a full-blown crisis. Um, it's hard to go a day without seeing something like this. Um, you know, headlines about kids not uh, showing up for school or parents being so stressed out about um, staying engaged and, and also keeping their kids engaged. Um, and maybe even worst of all, these problems aren't uh, equally distributed. Uh, it's the most vulnerable students and families who are being hit the hardest by this. So how can educators keep kids engaged and motivated while they're learning at home? Uh, look no further than games. Uh, your kids love games, you love games. Uh, just because games are fun doesn't mean they're easy and it doesn't mean that they don't have something to offer education. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that here, but basically, um, you know, the idea is that successful learning experiences need to be motivating and culturally relevant. And that just happens to be two areas where games excel. Um, so here are two things you're probably familiar with. On the left, obviously, we have Fortnite, one of the biggest video games of the past decade. 
Uh, on the right, we have the floss, which is a dance that I can't do. Um, and you might think that these things don't have anything to do with one another, uh, but they actually do. The, the floss dance was really popularized in part um, by Fortnite. Fortnite has this whole culture around it, and it just goes to show um, games aren't just popular with kids. Um, they don't just engage kids. They actually drive um, and influence youth culture. Now, uh, not to get too uh, capitalistic, I guess, but um, you know, we can use revenue as our guide to, to you know, understand how big of a force games are in youth culture uh, globally. Well, let's go back to 2009. We can see there on the chart, you know, gaming was about equal to uh, music and film combined in terms of revenue. Um, since then, in a little more than 10 years, it's now 2.5x. Um, so we all know, um, uh, you know, how influential music and film were to us, or, you know, I, I, you know, can say how influential it was for me. This is games, you know, 200 or 2.5 X. So, um, you know, the, uh, the relevance of games is kind of showing up on the bottom line for companies. Um, let's go back to the concept of motivation. Um, Motivation evokes uh, lots of positive associations. You know, I think of um, I think of getting up early. I think of like you know keeping my workout streak going or checking off items on a to do list. But like, not all sources of motivation are the same. Um, and when it comes to understanding why games are so valuable, uh, it's worth examining. Uh, it is worth examining the two different types of motivation. So uh, the first type of motivation is extrinsic motivation. Uh, essentially do this, get that. Um, kind of a hallmark of uh, traditional PBIS programs that have reward stores. Um, and then there's intrinsic motivation, which is sort of do this because you care about it, or you want to do this because you care about it. Um, both types of motivation uh, can be effective in the short term, but intrinsic motivation is much more sustainable impactful, and impactful. Uh, the problem is it's just much more difficult to foster. Fortunately, uh, games are awesome drivers of motivation. Uh, here are a couple of examples uh, that you might be aware of. Um, you know, Minecraft and meaning with World of Warcraft and you know, dis uh, demonstrating competency with Tetris. Why are games such effective motivators? Well, uh, it has to do with their ability to fulfill our fundamental human needs um, for things like autonomy, uh, competency, and social relationships. Um, coincidentally or not, this is exactly what great teaching has done for ages. Uh, one of the tenets of Classcraft is that when uh, our fundamental needs are met, we thrive. Um, so really there is a strong correlation um, between what we know about great teaching and what we know about great game design. Um, and so that leads me to, of course, you guessed it, uh, Classcraft. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask everybody to buckle up for a quick sales pitch. Uh, don't worry, I'm not a salesman. Uh, class, so Classcraft is a platform that harnesses the power of games uh, to create playful collaborative experiences that promote growth and human connection. Um, Classcraft is not a game per se. It's an approach and a tool that uh, helps educators manage behavior, borrowing all the things that make games so effective. Um, and then uh, this slide just provides like a quick overview of what you can do with Classcraft. But, um, you know, just to summarize, you can set behavior expectations, you can motivate your kids, um, and you can build a sense of community um, that includes actively engaging parents. Um, maybe most important of all, or if not uh, uh, most important of special importance to this group, um, uh, Classcraft integrates seamlessly with Google Classroom. Um, we are a uh, premier partner of Google Education. Um, we also have a Chrome extension that allows you to experience all the cool benefits of Classcraft directly within the Google Classroom environment. Um, so one of the, we mentioned a couple of things Classcraft does. I'll keep it quick here. Um, 
uh, one, one area where it really excels is fostering or uh, building uh, non-cognitive skills. So if, again, it fosters collaboration over competition. Um, one of the uh, common misconceptions of games is that it's all, it always has to be competition. Um, Classcraft is built on an approach that really, really values and favors collaboration. Uh, collaboration is actually part of our company values. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, it's not just how we design the product, it's like why we come together as a group of people. Um, it, it also has real life stakes. So um, I'm sure we'll talk in a second uh, when we, we get to our panel about the powers uh, that Classcraft offers kids, uh, which gives them greater control over their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and it's also customizable, it works across grade levels and subject areas. Okay, sales pitch almost over. Um, I mentioned setting clear behavior expectations. So one of the cool things about Classcraft is that it has behavior presets, um, basically like a framework for rewarding points for different positive behaviors. Um, it's great, uh, but what if you're suddenly teaching in a remote learning environment and you're finding that a lot of the behaviors that you used to want to promote just aren't quite as relevant and you want to reward kids for like showing up to a Zoom meeting on time. Um, well, fortunately, uh, we have debuted recently uh, a set of behavior presets specifically for remote learning um, that are available for different grade bands. So it's kind of uh, scales up and down the spectrum um, and works nicely in conjunction with our behavior presets for social distancing, which educators can use uh, within the classroom. So you can already see how it's easy to kind of talk, like Classcraft allows you to toggle between um, an in-person environment and a remote setting, which is something that I would imagine many of you are going to be uh, navigating uh, this school year. Here's a quick GIF uh, of Classcraft in action that just serves as a break to give me a chance to have a glass of water. Okay, uh, sales pitch concluded. Um, I hope you enjoyed sort of the brief introduction to Classcraft. Um, we're really here to talk to our panelists. Um, that was just kind of like a, a preamble. So let's get to our, Google, our panel of Google innovators. Um, I'm going to uh, just kind of spend a couple minutes talking um, with each of them about uh, their experience using Classcraft, particularly in a remote setting. Um, so, uh, Gianna, I was actually thinking we could start with you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us before we, you know, really dive in, like, what should we know about you, your approach or your students, like, uh, to understand your experience, what do we need to know about you? Uh, so me, as far as, as experience, I am, um, immigrant. So migrated to the United States. English is my second language. I've been teaching for 20 years, but it is my third career. Um, weird, right? <laughs> um, mathematics as a background, but computer science has always been my jam because that's what my original degree was in. Um, let's see. I've worked in highly collaborative environments. When I worked in other careers and then when I came into teaching, it became kind of like a silo effect. Um, which doesn't feel good, um, especially when you notice success with your students kind of jumps or spikes whenever there are collaborative moments um, for them to kind of build each other's weaknesses and kind of like propel the learning forward in their small groups. So I love um, my intro to Classcraft, actually my reintroduction to Classcraft, the second time that I, that I tried it, I did try it with a colleague and then it kind of became, it was, it was first as an idea that was thrown out to another colleague and then it kind of spread to the grade level team. And then we just all decided, you know what? It's June, let's switch things up. Let's roll out Classcraft to our eighth graders and let's use it as a format to throw out STEAM learning uh, components and assignments for all subjects for that grade level. Um, and let's see what happens. We didn't have any expectations. We were just, we wanted to try something different. We wanted to, to have something that honored the collaborative, uh, collaborative spirit that we had with the eighth grade teaching team. And we wanted the students to have just one place to go instead of visiting all these multiple Google classrooms for assignments. And instead of students going to multiple uh, teacher meetings, um, 
we had one meeting once a week and all the grade level teachers were there, even the clusters. Um, and we kind of like, we moved teaching into like Google Forms where our whole lesson was in the form with questions and tasks attached. And then we dropped that into story mode in Classcraft. And what we noticed was not only did we have an increase in student attendance in our once a week meetings, which was great. Um, but the other thing was we had students completing assignments a lot quicker. In story mode, we kind of had it auto so that if they completed something, it would automatically um, give them access to the next piece. And some kids just kind of stayed through until they finished everything for the week. Um, they didn't know that they were completing assignments for every single class and because it was hidden in the story mode component. The, these were their little individual story mode tasks and they just kind of, it was like little bites. Um, so it was exciting to see, uh, it, especially when um, in comparison to our seventh grade, seventh grade, I rolled it out as a solo because there wasn't collaboration there. Everybody was like, no, we like what we're doing. It's working. And so um, it was nice to see that even though I, I rolled it out as a solo with seventh grade, I still had increased um, attendance to my meets with those students and I still had increased completion of assignments with students. That's awesome. And just for those unfamiliar, I'll just give a quick overview of story mode. Um, so story mode is uh, this really cool thing. Um, it is um, a set of pre-written storylines uh, for quests that allow teachers to kind of like harness the power of narrative um, and adventure and take advantage of a lot of like cool personalization tools like, you know, branching paths um, without actually having to create stories. It has this whole universe of characters and locations kind of like an adventure, a personalized learning adventure. Um, so Jenna, what, what was it um, that got them so into story mode, do you think? I think it was um, that intro video that you guys have for, for um, story mode. I don't know if you like, you can play a snippet of it, but I did play the intro to story mode in Classcraft to my students. And they're like, whoa, what is going on with the story? Like, how do we figure it out? And I was like, well, first you have to go and make your character. And like, that'll be your first assignment. And they're like, and then what? And I was like, well, then read more, you know, as it kind of goes through. So it was a nice little teaser where they felt like they were part of a story in per se. And they got to, it was kind of like when Netflix releases something and it's a great series. You can kind of binge on it if you want to. And so I specifically set up my assignments where they could binge through the story mode because each, each, um, each part of the story was attached to a task. So they kind of can go through it as quickly as they wanted to. And, um, and you can control that. You can have it self-paced. You can have it where, you know, they complete one thing, then the next task shows up automatically. Or you can toggle it so that you have to review the work and you, you can uh, revise and, you know, with students in conference before you push them on to the next thing. I went with Oda since my, my assignments are self-graded through forms. So as long as it, they had it complete, they were able to kind of move forward. Um, but it, what was cool was that they, they noticed that now they were getting points for like, you know, turning in things on time, which is one of the, I think that was new for, um, for Classcraft, I'd never seen that before, before you had to like set up like what you were um, rewarding, what positive behavior components you were rewarding. They had this um, expectation package for remote learning that kind of fit everything that you would want to promote for students anyway, right? Like, you know, attending the Zoom meetings on time or like for us, it was Google Meet meetings, um, participating, you know, helping out classmates. So those are all things that you want to kind of reward. And then the other one where like, if they turn things in on time, of course, they're going to get points, but there, there's bonus. There's actually two bonuses to turning in work early, right? Now you have additional time to conference with me to improve, or you can kind of move forward at your own pace. Now you're customizing and learning on the student end. And so I appreciated that as a teacher. And I know my students kind of thrived in that environment because my students tend to be highly independent they like to kind of go at their own pace. I even have students that like 
wait for the last possible moment and then they do every single assignment. So in this case, it was a lot more engaging than just having a bunch of assignments in a Google Classroom stream for them to kind of like, you know, task through one, you know, task grab it one at a time. Mm -hmm. This was attached to an interesting story that was already, I didn't have to create the story. <laughs> the story was already there. I was just attaching assignments so that they can see and, and read. Right now I'm being tricky because I'm forcing them to read the next part of the story. And they were. Um, so that's really cool. So like not only um, did it bring in the power of, of story and not only like did you have the ability to personalize, did it, was it helpful in creating that sense of community or collaboration you were looking for because like, hey, I've got like a shared experience I can create here. There's something that we're all buying into. I think it did in, in, in some ways. And we did use it for a short time. We only had four weeks. So it did kind of fuse, you know, community. We didn't have students and teams. We had them as solos, but they were helping each other. When we had our team meetings and we were reviewing assignments and like, hey, this is where you might you might need additional help or these might be some pointers to kind of complete the task this week a little bit, you know, um, with a little bit a higher level of success, right? So in those sessions, kids were now taking the lead and going, hey, that assignment that's due next week, you know, and, and the other kids are like, what are you talking about? What assignment is due this week? They're like, oh, when you get to item number four on the map, you know, you have to, you have to make sure you watch that video twice. Otherwise you're not going to know how to get through the different questions that they have for that assignment. So now the students are kind of taking the lead and giving each other advice on how to kind of complete assignments, um, with a higher success rate. So, um, what surprised you most about Classcraft? I was, what surprised me most, I think was, the willingness for like my colleagues to collaborate with me um just because it was like the second time i had i had tried it and i did invite others to try it with me the first time but i think i had a colleague who went with me through to the training and she's a boomer um and she was like oh my gosh this is so fun this is so similar to harry potter i'm such a fan so she we like we totally nerded out on how to like create a whole story mode for like how we're gonna do this in september right since we're planning on like doing our whole year as like a team teaching like ela eighth grade and like kind of across to me with the technology piece so now we're collaboratively planning our year long right um tasks using the different stories that the students will read during the course of the year and so like her excitement because we went to the training together in seeing that wow it is like possible to have one game map and have all the subjects show up but the kids don't know you know what homework they're doing they don't know that they're doing social studies versus science because they're not going to a specific google classroom they're going to the map and they're like reading a section of story and then completing a task to then get to the next piece of the story and so that was the, the piece that was exciting for me because not only did it make, it was definitely a lift as far as like planning, right? Um, but it was a bigger lift when it came to tricking students to completing assignments. And, and that, that to me was fun. Anytime you, you make something, um, you gamify anything for our kids, like their brain format is kind of like, oh, I can get points. I can level up. I have a character. Oh, I can train pets. They just, they just lose their minds over that <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> I'm imagining the emoji of the head exploding. No. Yeah. Yeah. My son's 20 and he's like, he's grown up a gamer. So I've raised a gamer at home. So I've like sat alongside and I can, you know, they love the instant feedback. They love knowing right away if they did it right or not. They know, and I set up my lessons that way. And I feel like because I set up my lessons and my teaching that way because they get instant feedback. I think that's where we have a higher success rate and it's hard to do that. Um, but Classcraft kind of helps along the way because now they're looping it into something else that kids love, which is like stories. They love stories. Um, yeah, something I want to come back to, you mentioned at the beginning that um, you observe some really, you know, tangible results by using Classcraft. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those. You mentioned even recording some data. 
I did. And I, <laughs> I don't have access to it right now. I'm a little locked out. But I know that like when I look at my Google Classroom and my completion rates and I look at my Google Classroom attendance, I have spreadsheets on this, my attendance because it just increased. So I had maybe sessions with my eighth graders. We would meet once a week. Eighth grade always had more attendance. We're a K through eight school, but that's our graduating group. So they they were always in on our sessions, but we never had a hundred percent because they wanted to know about like yearbook. They wanted to know about graduation and all of that. Our seventh grade didn't have that kind of like big deal end of year thing to look forward to. So we noticed a spike in in both. Right, the bigger spike was in seventh grade. Like their usual attendance was maybe like three students, right out of 64 right and for that seventh grade group after we you know kind of released class draft out into the wild um i went from three students once a week to 15 the following week right and then by the end of the year by the last week of that five week cycle i had 50 percent attendance i had like the 34 students which was a huge jump from like, you know, two. That's awesome. <laughs> it, wasn't, um, and it wasn't anything different that I did on my part. Like as far as like, was it an additional planning piece? No. Was it, um, did I have to modify my instruction or my tasks for my students? No, because everything was synced and so Google friendly and I'm, we're at a G suite school. So anytime, I see anything that kind of like plays well in the Google sandbox, of course, I'm going to go for it. So, you know, the students loved it. It did increase it. We got a hundred percent attendance with eighth grade by the last week of, you know, by week five. But I know from, from week one to week two with eighth grade, we went from 40 students to 55, which was like 96%, which was huge because we had never gotten past that percent mm -hmm. kind of like below or at so you mentioned that you would try anything kind of in the google classroom ecosystem so pretend that i'm like an educator using google classroom okay kind of interested i'm doing remote learning i'm kind of interested in class craft what would you do to sort of like what would you say to me to get me to actually like start using it i say go to the free training first okay. <laughs> it's free yeah it's free um and it's fun the other, the other thing I would say is if you are like me and you're a long-term planner and like you just, you already have your lessons like for that unit and you already have like, you know, your video, your Google form, what, whatnot. And you would, if you're a Google person in classroom, if you would like post just to make your, your life easier, Google allows you as a teacher to post things with a release date so that students don't see it, but you can actually post everything for your unit there different release dates, right? So students don't get to see it until that day that you specify. Um, Classcraft is the same way. So you just kind of like load everything to your Google Classroom and then you hop into Classcraft and then you decide, okay, if you wanna do story mode, you can choose which story. And then each story gives you eight tasks that they kind of break it up into different eight, eight different um, parts of the story. So then you would attach assignments to each. So the only thing I had to change instructionally for me was to make sure that I had eight assignments for my last unit versus like 12, um, which was fine. Like I don't mind scaling back because what I did is I modified my assignments. So I, I got the 12 things that I was looking for just in eight sessions. That's great. Uh, well, Jenna, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us. Ashley, I want to get to you next um introduce us to i mean you introduce yourself introduce us to uh your students and your school and also how you use classroom or class craft excuse me sure i am a middle school teacher and we have grade sevens um and eighth in our building with about 800 plus students um, so we're broken down into house teams i'm in a team of um three other teachers and myself we all teach core classes um, our students um, in our district is just, uh, it's a suburb of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Um, so probably a little bit different than a lot of the, the New York <laughs> um, people I'm seeing kind of popping up here. Um, 
We have about uh, 114 students usually, or 115 students in our house every year. So um, my class size is around like 24 to 30 students, somewhere in there. Um, like I said before, I teach social studies, um, specifically uh, European history, um, but we uh, um, I don't know, have a lot of fun with the history that we do learn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so walk me through your transition to remote learning. What was that like? What, um, what worked and what, what maybe didn't work as well? Great. Um, we found out um, 10 minutes on a Friday before we were going um, virtual that we were going virtual exactly the same time as our students. Um, so there was <laughs> no time to prepare them at all. We, you know, we kind of had a feeling because that was the way a lot of other districts were going. Um, but it was not like, hey, let's practice being online. Let's practice doing these things. Um, up until that point, I hadn't been using ClassCraft um, and started using it after we'd made that transition. Um, for my students, it was not terrible because we do a lot of online work already in, in school, so it was not a big um, difference for them. Um, maybe just a little less hands-on than we normally would. And I like to do a lot of simulations, of course, in history, um, but they were very comfortable with the technology that we're using. Um, and then I ended up using um, Classcraft after I got started a little bit into it to help with engagement of students because right away kids were excited. They were like, this is new. I want to try, you know, doing all this stuff online, you know, seeing my teacher in a video call is kind of cool. Um, and then that kind of faded away after a few weeks and they're like, eh, I want to sleep in. I don't really want to see my teacher so early. I want to work in the middle of the night instead of during the daytime. Um, so I saw a lot of my classes, I would have, you know, 20 to 30 kids live with me, and then I always did recordings of my lessons, but I saw that drop down um, as low as um, four or five students coming to, like, our, our weekly meetings and things like that. So you very much had the experience that we kind of talked about at the top of just getting kids engaged enough to show up. So what was it about Classcraft that helped? I know, okay, so uh, spoiler alert, I know you're a Boss Battles fan. Mm -hmm, I am. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, um, so I, like I kind of just mentioned, I do weekly meetings with my students. That was something I did all year long, um, and we just kind of walked through what was going on in the week, um, what, what they could expect for homework, what they, you know, they maybe have tasks to do um, that are a little bit longer, more difficult, or things that they might need help. Um, and that was the, the I was really losing engagement in there. I went, like I said, from about 30 students coming to those meetings to about five. I actually had one at one point, just one student who came, so that was a little rough. Um, and then I introduced Classcraft, um, where they got to pick their teams um, to work together. We didn't do a lot of the working together, but they were pretty excited about being on a team and working collaboratively because we had none of that once we went virtually. Um, and then I introduced boss battles on my weekly meetings and my attendance and engagement skyrocketed. It was, um, I think my highest class was like 40 or 50 students coming in um, for one meeting, which was really exciting. Um, and it was really simple. It was a five question boss battle. I kept it um, based on the content we had learned the week before, but I did let the students work together and they, uh, they loved it. They were very engaged, they were very excited. Um, I would kind of pose the question to one of the students, and then if they couldn't answer it, I would let them um, ask for, for help from friends or um, whoever else was on the video call. So they would um, actually collaborate, they would discuss, they would talk through it, they would be yelling to the chat, no, that's wrong. Um, and so it was very fun to see seeing them engage um, again with each other because that had definitely kind of disappeared once we went virtual. So that was definitely one of the ways that I used um, the game. I actually skipped one week. I didn't do a, um, a boss battle and I almost had a revolt on my hands. <laughs> they were yelling at me so much. <laughs> They're like, French Revolution, we're revo you know, we're, we want a new teacher. <laughs> they were mad. <laughs> so I had to bring it back the next week. So what do you think did, I mean, a five question quiz. What, um, how do you engage kids or, you know, that much with just a five question quiz? What, what was it that clicked? Honestly, I think it was the collaborative piece. Um, while we're in school, I do a lot of group work. They're working together in teams. They're helping each other out, a lot of discussions and things like that. And when we went virtual, it was all individuals. They were all by themselves, 100 and 
15 kids, 130 kids, and they didn't get to talk to each other anymore. They were talking maybe socially, but they didn't have that academic and content engagement. Um, but once I got into the boss battles, I was bringing those content questions back in. Um, they were really mad if they got it wrong. They would say, like, I'm so sorry you got it wrong. It was my fault. And it was a great for, way to see them starting to engage with each other again in an academic setting and not just maybe through FaceTime the whole time or, you know, Snapchat. Um, but they were engaging um, collaboratively with our content um, and working together as teams. Was it easy to get up and running? Oh, yes. Yeah. Very, very easy. Yeah. Um, there was one time, well, the week after I forgot, then the, another week I uh, was, in, I forgot and I was like, oh no, I got five minutes. I can put this together really quick. And I did right before, before the meeting because I knew they would, they would be very upset with me if I didn't have an, <laughs> another boss battle the next week. That's awesome. Did you take advantage of the remote learning presets? I did, yes. Um, it was actually really nice because I didn't have to like think of um, some of those ways to give XP um, because this is all new. It's, you know, something else to try to think of, try to remember, or come up with. Um, so having the presets was really helpful because um, then I could just go through, I would just mark the kids who were present and then um, give them very, the really quick rewards. And I, I loved giving out the points as much as possible to them because it got them really excited about the, uh, you know, customizing everything for their characters. Um, that's awesome. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Gianna, which is, what do you tell to somebody who's like thinking about using cloud or who's maybe nervous about um, some of the challenges of, of remote and also going back and forth between remote and, and in person? Um, what would you tell them to get them excited about Classcraft? Um, I think one of the, I'm facing the challenge myself is we are supposed to be going back, but it might be a virtual um, kind of emergency two weeks. We don't know. Um, and we are expecting that we're going to be in and out of the classroom all year this year. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about and, 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 and am encouraging the ones I'm working with is that this is going to work whether we're in class, whether we have, you know, 10 students who are quarantined and can't be in class with us and I'm working kind of in a blended environment, or if we're completely online again, um, because it's, it is computer based, of course, which is helpful. Um, it also is safe because they, we're fortunate we are one to one, so that way kids can be online with, um, you know, on Classcraft and I don't have to worry about them sharing devices or sharing materials or things like that. Um, but because of some of those presets, it will be simple to move from in the classroom to online, um, kind of keeping some of our PBIS standards going from one direction to the other um, as we have to go in and out of the classroom this year. That's great. Um, well, Ashley, thank you uh, so much. Uh, Sean, we're going to head over to you now oh, and yeah. you go back a ways with Classcraft. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm an OG Classcraft guy. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2015, I guess, not long after it started and in the early days. I mean, here's the real story of my Google connection. I was setting up my first Classcraft class um, it was like October 2015, early in the school year, I had just discovered it existed. And I was at a Google level one training at the uh, Google offices down in Chelsea in lower Manhattan, uh, learning to get my Google level one certification. And honestly, not for Google, because like the Google people were awesome, but some of the people that they brought in were not great for that one. It, it got considerably better over the next several years, but that was like the first one they ever did. And uh, I'm there actually spending the time instead working on setting up my class craft class and people are like looking over my shoulder like, what is that? That looks cool. And this was early days before it was nearly as easy as it is now. But yeah, so my, my class craft time goes, goes way back. So you have experience using it in an in-person environment and then also from what I gather this year in New York City using it in a remote environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my students that I work with as I sort of hinted to you before, are all students with disabilities, um, the majority of which have autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and it's also in the most diverse county in the United States, go Queens. Uh, and uh, there you go, Jim. Uh, so these are, these are the students who in the midst, all the time, but especially in the midst of remote learning are often the most marginalized in these situations, right? Because my students have disabilities, so they have the most challenge getting access to devices for it to be accessible. The fact that um, 
well, well, I'll put it this way. Uh, District 75, we all know that United States was hit hard. New York City was hit particularly hard. Queens County was hit harder than anywhere in New York City. And District 75 within the DOE was hit harder than any other district because we have a large population of students with uh, uh, health impairments. We have a lot of paraprofessionals who live in poverty. Um, and so, so there was a lot of people who were lost and suffered and were sick and ill. So, you know, in the midst of it, I guess, I guess, cause you were asking them about what was their beginning setup. I guess I'll get into that. Classcraft was not my concern day one at all. Uh, we were doing Classcraft all year. I've been doing it with my students for a while. Um, it's majorly incentivizing and stuff, but day one, it was about getting connected to parents, parents who speak a variety of languages. So lots of translation stuff involved uh, to all the uh, Brazilian people I see in the chat, bon dia. Uh, so my <laughs> wife would get mad if I didn't say hello. Uh, she's Brazilian, by the way. Um, so we had to get parent communication on board. Uh, we had to get devices out to kids because this was basically like suddenly Monday, oh, kids aren't coming to school on Monday. We learned that on a Sunday afternoon. Hey, get rolling and get everything together. Um, get them access to networks, get them access to devices, get them access synced into the materials that we're gonna use. Um, and then because of all that challenge and struggle, there was a lot of social emotional stuff but it was very quickly that my students, because we didn't do it the first week in remote learning, because I'm just back to basics and getting everybody connected and let's have a live meeting and let's talk. Where is everybody at? How is everything going? Um, and then they were like, okay, when are we going to start Classcraft up again? And I was like, oh, oh, I wasn't even thinking about it. Like, because I was too focused on just, are you there? Are you okay? And it helped them be more okay because they felt that sense of normalcy. We got to return to it. They were incentivized just the way Ashley and Gianna were saying. Um, and that social emotional piece is, is a huge part of what Classcraft really is. It's connecting students across, uh, yes, the behavioral, but yes, those social connections. So um, it even has that parent communication piece, which was cool in there. So I could tap into that. And so I could tap into there and, and use different language connection things to connect parents in. I even, I even in the midst of it got set up so we had like family game time because I knew that for a lot of these, the parents had to be helping the students anyway. Um, so we, we might as well make it motivating for the parents too. So we basically did games where the students and parents could all play collectively. There were sections that were specific to the students so I could measure their learning. There were sections heavily for the parents so that they could have fun and feel engaged. Um, like I said, translation pieces, sometimes it required using picture symbol communication systems because my students were nonverbal. Uh, but, uh, I guess in terms of use of Classcraft, where it got really big was just getting them to first log in early in the morning for attendance and early for our initial meetings throughout the week. Uh, I used the Writers of Vey feature, which is like that uh, random events, which when I was in person in class, I found it to be really useful. I used to do this thing called like virtual or video of the day that would draw kids in and get them all situated and ready to work because it was the cool viral video of the day but then once i discovered classcraft i found that that was much more powerful so they they would all get ready for the random event and see how it would impact them uh sometimes the random events were specific in the classroom to student disabilities so uh students could only communicate one of one of the random events would be students could only communicate with um non-verbal uh, cues which was awesome because I had lots of students who used communication systems so they spoke with their iPads right but then all the other students had to learn what the challenge was for them in communicating so it was a sort of empathy exercise other ones where uh, I had students in wheelchairs where it was like a uh, curse of the golem where they were basically frozen to their seats you know unless they had to go to the bathroom uh, and uh, so all my students who were in wheelchairs were still mobile about the classroom and stuff, but uh, my other students got to learn, again, that empathy piece. And so, so we did some of that same stuff in virtual spaces where we tried to empathize with student languages in those uh, events. One of the big new ones, because this, this was totally new to Classcraft to me, and I only learned about it over this past year, was the kudos feature that, um, what is it, Shrine yeah. of the Ancients, right? And that was huge. Like, the number of times we had students First off, it was incentivized because giving uh, their peers uh, compliments on the work they were doing and all that kind of stuff earned them extra badges and points and blah, blah, blah. But the kind of positive stuff that students were sharing, and even for my non-verbal students who were able to like link to things where they recorded a video and 
in, in other places in Flipgrid and their Google Drive, uh, where they were communicating through picture symbols and imagery, uh, their, their affection and how much they missed other kids. I mean, there was even one scenario where there was a student who was selectively mute all year. So the whole physical classroom time never spoke to any of his classmates, did not speak in class with words. He was so incentivized to the fun he was having in it that he recorded a video of him. Hello, classmates. Yes, I can talk. It's like one of those, like, your heart wrenching, my eyes are tearing up kind of moments. And ooh, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't do the boss medals, but a few times um, when we did it, I tried to use a Google Doc so that the teams uh, could have like background chats and stuff about as they discussed what their answer was. But I did use the quests a lot or what you described as story mode. Story mode is sort of a different thing where it's just the narrative piece, but the quests, which was really cool because I could uh, send kids on differentiated pathways. So, you know, it was essentially this kid's going off on a side quest that they're really excited about because it's a side quest. Basically it's remedial work because they didn't get it the first time around, but they think it's a cool side quest. And the other kids are like, how come I don't get that quest? Oh, that's awesome. It's like, it's extra work, but they don't know that. <laughs> Which, is, which was the other crazy piece. And this happened in person as well as online. I had kids who enjoyed the work because I do a lot of like project-based hands-on types of learning with students and other game-based learning. So it'll be like Minecraft education, like uh, Dragon Box for math, you know, some esports stuff, right? But, and, and part of that is because mine are the type of students that don't learn from standing in a fr front of a room talking at them. So a lot of those synchronous learning experiences in a video, just like probably now for people, you're starting to get a little burnout listening to us talk. Um, that doesn't work for them ever at all for even like five seconds for the most part. So it has to be incentivized this way. I would argue it doesn't work for most other kids too, but at least you can get away with it for a while. <laughs> um, so that way through these quests, they were incentivized to dig deeper and drive through and I literally had students begging me for more work. I was like, I'm trying, I'm working like 18, 20 hour days, like getting stuff together. And, but it doesn't need to be like that, but that's just me insane. Cause I'm, I'm technically like helping every other teacher in the school and all over the place learn how to fix stuff. Uh, one of the questions that was asked, it's not very hard. It doesn't have to be like, you don't have to go as crazy as I do with it. Uh, I, I know you have light mode. I've never used light mode cause it's not as much fun for me. But it's just the behavior management piece. So it can be easy. When I first started, I had to set up, like now there's a whole introduction piece where it tells students all about class craft and the magic and the wonders and like what the XP is and what HP, that didn't exist when I first started. So I had to make that up all on my own in like slide decks. And so I had like a Google slide presentation for students to let me explain what this is to you. And they're like, what are you talking about? So yeah, it's way, way easier now, especially for remote learning. That's great. I, don't know. I talked for um, a long time. I think we are remiss in not talking more about the parent piece you brought up. Um, and John, if you want, I saw you giving a thumbs up earlier. So if you want to chime in here too, please do. How is Classcraft helpful in getting parents to play an active role in remote learning? I don't, do you want to go first? Yeah, I don't know. No, me. Okay, I'll go. I don't know. Uh, for me, go ahead. Parent mode. <laughs> <laughs> was I was just um, excited just to hear you talk and I was just like remembering um, just like if anybody else is in my age group or older um, if you remember Dungeons and Dragons this is this is so much like that but so much more so that, that's it <laughs> I mean there were there there were some nerdy parents who were like super into it and, and they <laughs> were like messaging me they were like can you make me a character too and I was like <laughs> if I have time <laughs> If I have time, maybe I'll make like a fake class for parents or something, right? Eventually I did for some of the parents, which was so weird. I was like, but I'm not going to take my time like giving you guys rewards and stuff. I'm just going to max you out and you play with it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I had a whole, but for even for the parents who weren't like super into the, like, I think, Gianna, were you the one who described the Harry Potterness of it all? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Although Ashley was mentioning uh, her, her house classes, so that's a little bit, I, I, I expected her to say like, I'm in Raving Club or something. But, <laughs> I was waiting for it too, I was like, hi John. But, but they, they, for them it wasn't about the like, oh look cool, it's sci-fi and fantasy. For them it was like, oh this is family game time. And so sometimes, 
I'm, I'm going to say this, even though I might get a little, in a little trouble, but nobody tell anybody. Um, so I scheduled sometimes family game nights for when parents were at home, because a lot of our, the parents of a lot of my students uh, were considered essential workers, and they worked in sanitation, and they worked food service, and all this other stuff. And so they're like, I want to do it, but I'm not going to be home until like five, six o'clock at night. It's like, fine, we'll do it at night if you want, and we'll do a family game night. I, I'm, I'm cool with that. I got time. My kids can wait for dinner, right? And so we did. And... Uh, so, so we would play some times at night. And I don't know if that's technically in the rules of the New York City Department of Education or if that's a we, good idea. We were asked in DOE to like be flexible and accommodating. So okay, good. So maybe I didn't break the rules, but I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> You're good. And, and I love how it does build community in such an inclusive, positive way. It's like super contagious. People kind of like, when I, yeah, I rolled it out to my students, you know, the two who showed up, heard you know really heard about it saw the intro video and then everybody else just kind of had like a posting in google classroom to like go to this link and get started and then um you know the you know my two kids who showed up started texting everybody like hurry up and join do this assignment we're trying to make teams so it's kind of like they pushed it forward well that was that was the thing i mean occasionally each year maybe it, less so now but each year i might have had like one or two kids who didn't opt in right off the bat and it's like, cool, you're in my regular class, you get regular learning tasks, you get all the regular class stuff. But by the time they got to see all the incentives that the other kids are getting and the things that they were earning through the reward systems and stuff in the game, they're like, oh, I want in now, I want in. I want to sign the, the pledge. There's a cool pledge for people who aren't aware that kids get to sign to join the game. I think some of the biggest changes though that I've seen over my big span of using it and, and even now in the last few months, I've had kids who suddenly took on like brand, it was, it, it was basically the conversations and the whole social structure of my class shifted, right? Uh, new leadership roles emerged among students who, even though I didn't set up team leaders, they're like, okay, I take this on. And maybe he was a, a young man with emotional behavioral disorder who misbehaved previously the most, but like now he's like, no, I'm in charge of the team and we're going to do it. And no, you get your act together and you get your act together and stop messing around. And it was awesome. Uh, struggling students, um, who normally like some of the other kids. So a lot of times in my classes with students with autism that are usually like 12 kids or less, there's very few girls, right? Because it's more prevalent among boys. So you'll get lots of boys in the class, maybe one or two girls. And sometimes the boys, again, because of social structures and try to get ostracized and you do all the things you can to bring them in. But once they recognize that the girls were healers and they needed them, the girls usually ended up choosing healers. It was just the nature of the game. Um, the nerdy boys chose to be mages. The aggressive boys chose to be uh, warriors. That's just the way it always tended to work out. And then they realized they needed the healers, so they had to be kindly to them. So they helped them who were struggling with their work. And then they helped the boys get healed. And it changed that whole dynamic. So instead of like, we're adversarial anymore, and this is the kid that I wouldn't want to hang out with in class and needs to sit at the other end of the lunch table. It's not like all my team, because I made sure when I set up teams, I always set it up with kids that weren't best friends necessarily. Um, so yeah, that aggression piece decreased. And then, and then kids were literally shouting out, like, did you see me help them? Did you see me help them? So they weren't constantly calling me to help. They were like, no, I'll do it. I'll help them, just because they wanted their character to level up. That, I mean, that whole shift in structure and the conversations that happened around it of how it wasn't even just talk anymore about the game. It was talk about like, I saw myself speak in a way that made you feel bad, which was language directly from our, our reward things in the game. And, and they were using that language to have conversations with each other, even during like social time. It was, it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Um... So Gianna, I know you have to run early, so I'll, I'll say goodbye to you and thank you. Um, Everybody. Bye. Um, Sean and Ashley, thank you for uh, sharing your stories as well. Um, I know we're a little over time. Um, there is a little treat for those who stayed till the end, um, which is a special promotion. Um, called our, uh, our, well, it's our brand new certified educator. Uh, program, not a promotion, it's something we're going to be doing, uh, you know, ongoing in the future. Um, so this program launches today, um, and it's essentially designed to deepen teachers' uh, familiarity with Classcraft and the pedagogy behind it. Um, essentially how it works is um, starting, I believe, t t 
to tomorrow, I think, um, within the game, uh, there will be a, um, uh, a, a little item on the, the right of the teacher dashboard inviting you to uh, take the certified educator quest um, after you complete the quest. And obviously you can sign up for Classcraft for free. Take the, um, uh, take the quest. There's a short quiz via Google Forms after it. Um, and if you pass, you become a Classcraft certified educator. You get a cool badge that you can show your creds off to. Um, but a special offer for uh, Google uh, innovators is you get a free uh, one-year subscription to Classcraft Premium, uh, which is a $120 per year value. So, uh, you know, pretty good, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the link or the URL is here on the page. Um, we are going to email this deck to everybody. Um, so you'll have it there as well. But basically, um, on an ongoing basis, uh, you'll be able to take the quest, complete the quiz. Um, and because of your awesome Google Innovator status, uh, land a one-year subscription to premium. So uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, if you enjoyed hearing our panelists talk about their experiences, like that can be waiting for you as well. Um, just sign up for free and, and to take the quest. So um, we also have, um, you know, some free resources here. We have a, a playbook for motivating students for fostering intrinsic motivation, irrespective of Classcraft. Obviously, Classcraft can be a part of it. Um, and we've got some cool SEL stuff as well. Um, and that's it. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending, but um, most of all, I want to thank um, our panelists, Ashley, Sean, and Gianna, who uh, took off earlier or just a couple minutes ago. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your story with other people who kind of approach education the same way. Um, we had a cool mix of, we, we definitely had a New York City flavor, but we also had, you know, uh, with Ashley, some, you know, geographical representation that might look more like, you know, middle America. Um, so cool to have that kind of mix. Um, I grew up in Illinois. So, oh, there you go. And I lived in Virginia. I've lived all over the country. Okay. Um, so uh, really, again, thank you. And to everybody who's listening, thank you for coming and uh, best of luck this school year. We know there's a big challenge ahead, um, hopefully with the certified educator program um, and with the remote learning presets, with the social distancing presets, like we're really trying to do our part to help. So um, if you have any questions, uh, just make sure you get them in the comments um, for our panelists. Maybe uh, if there's anything we didn't get to, we'll circle back um, and try to uh, follow up and get all those questions answered. So. Uh, thanks again.